Well, uh, we are coming to the conclusion of Mark chapter 12 this morning. And Mark chapter 12, a very rich chapter. I have found it uh, very helpful for myself, uh, very enlightening. Uh, one of the great things about uh, the privilege which I have as a pastor is I get to study the Word of God. And, and uh, when I'm going through a book like the book of Mark, a book which I had not preached through before, um, it, it's an awful lot of fun for me because I'm learning new things and I see new things or appreciate new things. And so that's always a joy. As I say this, uh, I'm, I'm coming now, uh, we'll be in verses 35 um, through 44. And as, as I say this, uh, it's an interesting section because what we see here is we see that one more group which Jesus uh, has started to address with the scribe, he is now going to not necessarily address them personally, but he's going to describe the scribes. And as he does so, he is, we see here a description of... Well, I, what I'll call a bankruptcy. Now, oftentimes when we think of a bankruptcy, we think of it in, in the way of money. Uh, and it's, here's the thing I always find interesting about uh, people in financial bankruptcy, is that it oftentimes takes place because you have somebody who has very little, and then all of a sudden they get an unexpected or uh, a large increase in their salary. I think of professional athletes, for example. It is very common for professional athletes who were college students, all of a sudden they're given millions of dollars and you think they can never use all that money, and then you find, them out, find out that they're, later on that they're, that they're bankrupt. It's like, how in the world did that happen? Um, I, I find it with people who uh, work really hard uh, at difficult de degrees, and uh, they get their college degree, they get their master's degree, perhaps they even get their, doc uh, their doctorate, and then all of a sudden uh, they were making nothing, now all of a sudden they're making a lot of money, and they have this new uh, conception of themselves. And this new idea of themselves is, well, I have achieved a certain level with my education, for example, and people of my education, therefore, should live at a certain status. And so then they begin to really spend money to live according to that status, but they're not really counting the money. And all of a sudden, they find themselves in a lot of debt, and they're all of a sudden in trouble. This is a common occurrence. It happens all the time. Well... I mean, it's almost as if they're taking the money, they're putting it in the pocket, not recognizing that there's a hole there. Well, this happens in the spiritual realm as well. You can have people who, who take religious things and say, oh, I got this memory verse and I got this church attendance, and they're, and they're putting them in their pocket, but because they are not combining these things with faith, it's almost as if it's spilling out. The Jewish leadership, which Jesus has been addressing throughout this chapter, okay, and we've seen Jesus, he's addressed the, the, the Pharisees and the, and the Herodians at one time. He then talks to the, San, uh, the Sadducees, and now he's talking to the scribes and describing the scribes. And we've seen this over and over again, that these are people who have taken religious things and they're putting them in their pockets. But because they have, because they have a pocket which has a hole in it because of a lack of faith, it spills to the ground. They have studied the law, but the evidence is, is, is down in the dust because they are not appropriating it with faith. They're not seeing things as they should. Well, again, as we've seen, we've seen the different groups. Now we come here to this final group. Last week, you'll remember that we looked at one scribe who asked Jesus a question, and he did a pretty good job. But now we finally get to the description of the scribes as a whole. They, they're not going to get the, the privilege of asking one further question. We see Jesus is talking to the religious leadership, or, or I, I think as he has answered their questions and as he, as he describes them, he does so in a sense almost as a tough love. He's trying to shock them with love, confronting them so that they would repent, but we do not see a repentance there. They think that they're spiritually rich, they're spiritually poor. They think they have all the answers, but they are the ones that are confused. They think they are doing right, but the reality is they are religious leeches. Come to then to Mark chapter 12, verse 35. Jesus now turns the tables and he begins to ask, how's your theology? How do you understand scripture? He turns the tables and now he's asking them a question rather than them asking him a question. Verse 35. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, hey, how can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? And David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. 
David himself calls him Lord. So how is it he is his son? Now, as we look at this, we say, well, I don't fully appreciate what Jesus is saying here. And I think that's fair enough because we need to go actually go back to Psalm 110, verse 1. And when we go back to Psalm 110, verse 1, what we see is that there is a, a nuance in the text which is not picked up in the New Testament. It's not picked up in my translation here in the English Standard Version either. But if we go back to Psalm 110, verse 1, we see that that nuance exists and it needs to be pointed out because it's the whole point of the chapter. So Psalm 10, or 110, verse 1, a psalm of David. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. You're like, well, that's the same thing. Yes and no. Look at that first line. The Lord says to my Lord. Now, in my Bible, and I'm almost surely in yours, it has a, a, a way to show you that the word Lord is different. The word Lord is used twice in that first line. The Lord says to my Lord. But the first Lord, if you'll notice in your Bible, I think it's in the King James, and I think it is in the English Standard Version, the way that they designate it, every letter is capitalized. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So the Lord here, so which this tells us is that that's the covenantal name of God, Yahweh. Okay? Sometimes people say Jehovah, but that's a bad pronunciation. Yahweh is the correct pronunciation. So Yahweh says to my Lord, notice here not every letter, is, they're not all capitalized. The L is, but none of the other ones are. And what this tells me here is that it is the Hebrew word behind that is the word Adonai, which is the same thing as master, sir. It's a, uh, it's, it's a form of address, somebody of high authority, but it's not the covenantal name. So what we say, see here is that Yahweh says to my master. That's a good way to, to, to translate it. So let's take that from 110 and let's take that over back into Mark. And Jesus is saying... Yahweh says to my master. Okay, so you're, at this, you're saying, okay, I still don't understand what the big deal is here. This is a psalm of David. And so he, David is saying, Yahweh says to my master. Yet Jesus' question is this. How is it that you can call the, my master, how can you call him the son of David? Because a son is always inferior in status to a father, Correct? That's the issue here. So if the Messiah, the master who is to come, is the son of David, how is it that David calls him my master? That doesn't make any sense. Unless the my master has a qualitative difference, has, who is so special in, in such a way that it is more important than the fact that he is the son of David. Now, that's very, very unusual. It's virtually unheard of, but there it is. And when we look at the different groups as Jesus is asking the question, they don't have any idea. They don't know. They have no understanding as how this works. Jesus has asked them a question which they cannot come up with. I always think it's interesting. You know, a lot of times people say, well, if you go to the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John has a big priority, and it's pushing the idea that Jesus is actually God. And I think that's true. John is clearly teaching that. But the people say, well, if you go to the book of Mark, that's not really there. Hold on a second. Mark is recording the fact that Jesus is asking this question. And the fact that Jesus is asking this question, it's pointing to the fact that Mark understands, as well as Jesus himself understood, that he is more important than his great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather. He's more significant. And why? Because he is more than simply a descendant of David. He is also the Son of God. Now, I want you to stay here, but I also want you to go over to Romans, Romans chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. When Paul is introducing his letter... I'll just read verses 1 and 2 just for context. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Boom. Now, concerning his son, who was descended from David, okay, according to the flesh. Now, this is somewhat debated, but I think I understand this one well here. When he says that the son is descended from David according to the flesh, I believe that the wording according to the flesh is not speaking so much about his physical descent, 
but it's speaking about Jesus who is descended according to the flesh, that is according to the sphere of weakness, because the flesh is associated with that which is weak. Keep in mind that Jesus, when he is enfleshed, right, he is hungry. He is tired at different times, so that there is weakness there. When Jesus, he is in, Jesus comes, he's incarnate, he therefore is the object of ridicule, a ridicule. He is not accepted. So Jesus comes in the sphere of weakness. But notice what happens in verse 4. And was declared to be the Son of God in power. And so that's, that's the contrast there. So we have the descendant of David in the flesh. That means according to weakness. But here we have the Son of God, de declared the Son of God in power. How so? By the resurrection of the dead, called so by the Holy Spirit. Boom. What we see then is we see that Jesus is not merely a physical descendant of David. But Jesus is, yes, the physical descendant of David, but he is also the Son of God. That is why David must call one who is way down in his lineage, my master, because Jesus is superior. That's why. That's why. So Jesus asks them this question, and they are stymied. They don't know. They, they give no answer. And it's interesting that the crowd, and the crowd, I don't think the crowd is necessary. I don't think they're great theologians. I think they like the fact that Jesus kind of stuck it to the people that sticks to them all the time. And the, and the great throng heard him gladly. They're like, oh, way to go, Jesus. You got, him, you got him good there. They were trying to get you. You got them. I think that's what's happened here. So as I look at this, and you say, well, what's, what's, the, what's the point in all of this? I think the point in all of this is that Jesus is trying to show them that the theology, the way that you understand God, the way that you understand who the Christ is, that theology, that understanding of who it is, will also affect the way you live your life. Because the rest of the section is the practical outworking of it. Keep this in mind. What did we see last week? We saw last week, we saw one single scribe, but the one single scribe came to Jesus, and he said, Master, he said, what's the greatest commandment? What's the first most? What's, the most, what, what's it? What's the overarching commandment? And Jesus says, you know, hear you, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, theological statement, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, etc., right? Boom, theological statement. And he says, and the second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, right? Practical. What we see, theological and practical. Theological, practical. What we see here with Jesus, he's saying, look at the identity of who I am, theological, and now he's going to look at the section, how do you live it out? Practical. Isn't that cool? What we have here then is we have, he sets up this theological idea, the, theology and practice, and then we see another wave of theology and practice. Isn't that cool? I, I, sorry, I get freaked out on these things. All right. So I look at this, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Okay, sorry. I'm going to, we'll probably be finished in five minutes because I'm speaking too fast. All right. So here we have it, this, this theological idea. The leadership believes that they are rich in knowledge, and Jesus is trying to tell them that no. You're not rich in knowledge. The most important thing, the, the understanding of who the Christ is, because you have not accepted him in faith, it has, it has dribbled out. It's, on the, it's in the dust. You are bankrupt and you don't know it. Now he moves in. He looks into the, the practical, the living out of the theological teaching. Verse 38. And in his teaching, he said, beware of the, and at this point you're expecting Beware of the dogs, beware of the false teachers, beware of you know, all kinds of stuff. Beware of the prostitutes, beware of the tax collectors, beware of the Romans, beware of lepers, beware of the Gentiles, something like that, right? No. Beware of the scribes. And again, we understand that the scribes, these guys are, are guys who understand the word of God well. And these are guys who are, who are copying the Bible. It's not like you had a, a photocopy machine someplace. These are guys who their profession is to take the Bible and they are to copy it. That's their job. And because they are copying it, they are very, very well informed about it. They, they count the words. They count how many words from the back to the front. They know what the middle word is. They know all of this. They've got it all, all things figured out. At least they think so. And what Jesus says, well, hold on a second. Beware of the scribes. Why am I to be aware of them? Well, he tells us. These are people who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts. 
These are guys because of uh, the, the religious nature of stuff. They've taken it and they're trying to profit off of it. And they think that they're doing well because they have the right clothes and they have the right words and they say the right things and they think that they are spiritually rich, but the reality is because they don't understand who the Christ is, because they don't appreciate what God has sent, they're actually spiritually bankrupt. These are guys who are benefiting in this world, but they are not benefiting in the world to come. Don't you always think it's strange in some uh, church traditions that you have people with specific religious clothing? I find that odd. Okay? I'm wearing my JCPenney sweater, my shirt that I got on eBay, my pants I got at Costco. Good enough, right? Yeah. I think it's strange when people have long, long, long ga garments and little collars and things like that. Why, why, what's the point of that? I don't understand that. What he's saying here, he says, you know, beware of, beware of those who, 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 who want accolades because of the things that they wear. Beware of those who like their greetings in the marketplace. You know, I, was or, I have been ordained, therefore I can put the, the, the three letters R-E-V in front of my name, <laughs> Reverend. Never call me Reverend. Oh, my goodness. Some of you are like, well, don't worry about that. We had no intention of doing that. It's kind of funny, I go up to Camp Gilead, you know, I'm usually there once or twice a year, and I'll go up there, and Jack Moyer, he's the, uh, he's the guy who's in charge up there, and, and I drive up, and my window's always down, and he's directing traffic, and he says, oh, he says, it's the Reverend Dr. McLean. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I mean, t technically, that's true. I, have, I have titles, big whoop, all right? It's not that important. The scribes have titles, to which Jesus is saying, big whoop. It's not that important. It's not about trying to, to get the, the praise of man. It's, it's, ladies and gentlemen, it's about pleasing God. And here we have these guys, and they've got the clothes, and they've got the, they've got the titles. I know people who get degrees just so that they can put initials behind their names. Fooey. These guys, they get the best seats in the synagogues. They get the places of honor at feasts. That's, that's profiteering in this world, but it's not... It's, it does nothing for the next. But here's the, here, it gets worse, though. These guys, these guys who are getting all of this, look at their practice. These are the guys who are devouring widows' houses. They're going about and trying to get tips from other people. They're trying to get a little bit of something, something. They're trying to get some little money from these, these widows, these women who are no longer protected. Perhaps they have some money, but they're, 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 getting, <laughs> they're getting their share. They're getting their cut from it. You know, I once was talking to a woman nearby, and she was considering coming to our church. She didn't end up coming to our church, so you don't know her. But she was considering coming to our church, and, and I asked her, I said, well, why, why are you thinking of doing that? And she, I, I said, are you attending church elsewhere? She says, well, I have been, but I, I, I've, I've given up on that church. I said, why is that? She says, well, the pastor there said he did not feel the love at the church. I said, what does that mean? She says, well, uh, he wanted a new Cadillac. And, she and the pastor said from the pulpit that the people needed to go ahead and put their money together to get him a new Cadillac. Really? That is terrible. If you ever hear that from me, yeah, tar and feathers time. That's that's uh, that'll be fine. So, actually, don't tar and feather. That's that sounds like that's, that's painful. I don't want to do that. So, but I but I tell you this, I won't ask for a Cadillac. You know, I'm more of a Toyota man. So anyway, so but but no, but seriously, when you, when we look at this, I mean, it's it, it's a ridiculous type of thing. And the guy's trying to take his position, and he's trying to take his title, he's trying to take his authority, and he and he's trying to parlay that into financial gain, and it's inappropriate. And that's what the scribes of the times are doing. Not only that, they try to cover it. They try to cover it by yet more religious pretense. Who devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. Oh, Lord, I thank you for these generous people who have given me this, all this money. Yay, me. You know, God sees this. Their defective theology is this. They don't truly believe that God is one. Because if they truly believe that God is one, that would under, they would understand that God sees everything that they do. They, they would understand that they're not hiding off in a corner someplace where they can do inappropriate activity that God does not see. 
They're involved in inappropriate activity, take advantage of people who can be taken advantage of to their shame, to their short-term financial gain, but to their spiritual bankruptcy. They will receive the greater condemnation. Jesus is unimpressed. God is unimpressed with this type of activity. So when we ask this question, I mean, how is your theology? You know, do you understand who Jesus is? But then we can ask this question, well, how is your practice? And your practice should be one. Again, look, look at that. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, mind, soul, strength, right? But then loving your neighbors yourself. And here we have people who don't understand who God and his Christ is. And here we have it where the people are not loving their neighbors as themselves. But then Jesus, he's going to end on a positive note. We scoot over now to verse 41. And we get to verse 41. We see here a positive example is given to us, which is, which is nice. Okay? So how's your theology? How's your practice? Now we see best practice. Verses 41 through 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money in the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. I got this from Walter Wessel. Evidently, they, they, they understand this from archaeology. Uh, and let me just uh, read a quote from him. Jesus sat down on a bench where he could watch people bring their offerings and put them in one, in one of the 13 trumpet-shaped boxes that were used for that purpose. Now, that's kind of cool, right? Yeah, trumpet-shaped. So my guess is, you know, it's got like a big mouth like this and it funnels down and it's made out of... I don't know, you know, some sort of metal, I assume. And here you have it, and so when people come, there's 13 of them, and there's boxes underneath to hold the money, and people would sort of drop their coins in it. It's kind of like in the malls. Remember in the mall, you used to put the coins in there, and the coins would spin all the way around? Yeah. I don't know if the coins actually were spinning around or not, but, but there you have it. And so there they are, and people were coming, and they're, and they're dropping in their money. Now look at verse 42. Oh, excuse me, look at the end of verse 41. Many rich people put in large sums of money. Now, this is not to condemn the rich who are giving money, by the way. The only reason that this is brought up is because there, wants, there is the desire to make a contrast between the rich and the widow who is going to come. Okay? So the, the rich are not doing anything wrong, in a sense, in that they're giving money. However, the contrast is important for us. That's, that's the focus. So the wealthy put their part in. They're not condemned. But we see here now the contrast. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, making a penny. Now, Jesus is looking at this, and here you have this widow woman. A widow, by definition, does not have the protection that a married woman would have, especially within the first century culture. She has no resources. She is not a, a widow who has resources, whose home can be devoured. She just has nothing. And we see here, and she is going to put two small copper coins in. Now, it's interesting. When I finished uh, preaching last Sunday, I had a couple of people come up to me, and they said, hey, look at this. There's actually two coins there. She's got two coins. And it's like, is that right? And so I, I, I didn't remember that, so I went back and I looked at it, and sure enough, it's two coins. So the question is, what is she doing? I mean, I think it's impressive, number one, that she's there, says she's giving anything at all. But, second, but on a secondary note, I'd like to point this out. Isn't it amazing that she doesn't put one in her pocket and put the other one in? I mean, wouldn't you do that? You got nothing. Matter of fact, you could justify it. I got nothing. I have nothing whatsoever, so at least I can go ahead and keep the, the half a penny coin. I at least have something like that. Maybe I can buy a crumb of bread with that. But here she is, and she's given both. I don't think that that detail is incidental. I think it's purposeful. It is to show us that she is all in. She's 100%. Hmm. Interesting little side note here. The widow came, and she put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. Now, the word here for penny is a Latin word. You say, why is that significant? It's significant for us because, obviously, Latin word, that means that this points to us that the, the audience which is receiving Mark is almost surely Roman, okay? Because the, the coin name is being translated in a way that people 
of a Latin background would understand it. Just as our translation here is penny, because penny for us in the English-speaking culture is the smallest of coins that we'd have. So when people ask, you know, how do we know where, you know, what was the intended audience? This is a good indication for us. Notice in other places, by the way, when they talk about certain groups, we are told what they believe and what they do. What we see here is there is an explanation to people who are not necessarily from Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what we have. That's a bit of a side note, but I think that's helpful for us. This poor widow came and she put in two small copper coins, which makes a penny. She's all in. When I lived in Burbank, there I am in Burbank, Washington. It's kind of a funny little place. Um, you know, it's more of a geographical area than what I would call a city. I think there was 3,000 people in the whole entire zip code, 99323. And here you have uh, this geographical area. Uh, the Mormons are very, very strong there, and then there's two Baptist churches in our little town less than a mile apart from one another. They should have combined. It would have been a lot stronger, but there's Baptists, and so what do you expect? You know, they've got to get in a fight. Okay. So I got a knock on the door, and it was three little girls from the other Baptist church. And they didn't know who I was. I was just, you know, a house in the neighborhood. And they came, they knocked on my door, and they said, uh, we are here collecting money for missionaries. Isn't this strange? Have you ever had somebody knock on your door and say, hey, we're, coming, we're, we're making a collection for missionaries? No. It's very strange. I mean, obviously, you know, if, when missionaries come to the church, maybe they get money there, but, but people knocking on your door? Strange. I said, really? Said, oh, yeah, we go to the such and such Baptist church. And I said, oh, that's kind of cool. And uh, we're collecting money for the missionaries. I said, oh, that's kind of neat. And... Uh, and so they kept on telling us more. And then finally, they, they got to the point, which I thought was kind of funny. They said, yeah, and when we're done collecting the money, we're going to take it to our house, we're going to count it, and we're going to take half of it and give it to the missionary, and with the other half, we're going to go out for lunch. <laughs> Man, they're very honest, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> you know, you know. So and I, was, you know, I thought, well, God, you know, God bless them. I mean, they're 8, 10, 12, something like that. I don't know how old they were. They're that, and they didn't know any better, you know? They didn't know that's inappropriate, you know? They didn't realize they're not supposed to work on commission for missionaries. <laughs> and so we look at, I look at that. So they didn't know any better. But think of the widow. And she has every rationale for to keep at least half back. Well, good grief, she has every rationale to keep both coins in her pocket. But she's all in. She gave both coins. I just think that's fabulous. Why does she give both coins? She gives both coins because she understands that she serves a great God. See, her correct theology leads her to correct behavior. And the incorrect theology of the, of the scribes leads them to a misunderstanding of who Jesus is, a misunderstanding of who their God is, and it leads them to bad practice. So, I, I, I get told people, I mean, I teach theology because I enjoy teaching theology. I think it's fabulous stuff. And I get people say, oh, we don't need to study theology because that's, you know, it's not, very, it's not very practical. Good theology is always practical. It just is. Good theology helps us understand more about God, helps us understand about our relationship with God, and therefore should have a practical application from it. Read the, the epistles of Paul over and over again. He starts off with heavy, heavy theological stuff. Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3, heavy theological stuff. And then, boom, we get into chapters 4, 5, and 6. It's talking about loving your wives and loving your husbands. And boom, practical, right? Because good theology leads to good practice. So here we have this widow who, if the scribes were to describe her, they would describe her as poor and kind of pathetic and not very important. But Jesus is describing her as rich, where he's describing the scribes as poor. Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. Again, those who put large amounts, it's not wrong in what they did. But notice that there's a difference. Verse 44, for they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all that she had to live on. Her heart is fully devoted. Go back once again. 
to Mark chapter 12 and in verse 29, when asked what is the greatest commandment, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And with every little coin you are to be willing to give it. And she is where the scribes are willing to take the religious paraphernalia, paraphernalia and take it and use it for profiteering. Listen, in the world in which we live in the 21st century with, with, within Christianity, and as the world, the secular world, they look at, at the church, and oftentimes they think of the church, oh, that's just a place where people go to fleece people from their money. And frankly, there's been enough false teachers out there, there's been enough poor, quote-unquote, ministers out there that has made them skeptical, and perhaps rightfully so. We must have financial integrity. We must have an integrity which understands who our God is, which forces us to practice in a godly way. I have a friend of mine. He uh, is a pastor in another church, kind of a bigger church. Um, they have several wealthy people within their church, and some of the wealthy people within their church use their money to leverage for power. They want to control the pastor. They want to tell him what to say. They want to control him what projects they can do, et cetera, et cetera. Because they say, well, let's say, if you don't do that, then we'll take our money. We'll go elsewhere. You know what? N not one cent of money which I have is mine anyway. And not one cent of the rich man, which I'm talking about here, it's not his money either. It belongs to the Lord. We are given a stewardship of money, and we are to use it for him and for his glory. Listen, God doesn't want us to be um, spiritually bankrupt. If we are to avoid spiritual bankruptcy, this means that we need to know the God of Scripture. We need to appreciate who Jesus is. And we see that up there in, the, in those first verses, in verses 35 through 37. Jesus is asking, hey, uh, essentially, who do you think this Messiah is? He's not simply just a physical descendant of David. He is the Son of God. You need to have good theology, which will lead to good practice. Good theology is good theology if it will lead you to love God more. Your good theology, if it is good theology, will help you love your neighbor more. We are to be a people who leave the pretense to the scribes, and instead we are to be a people who live with following the example of the widow who has nothing. I think as we come to the end of chapter 12, what an appropriate, appropriate way. Jesus will say in other places, take up your cross and follow me. Now we see the similar type of messaging, but it's with the image of a widow. Take up your cross and follow me. Now we see the widow gives everything. She's all in. Just as one who picks up the cross and follows Jesus is all in, so also is the widow who takes her coins, all that she has to live in, and now she is all in as well. So, Chapter 12, verse 44 is the end of Jesus' public teaching ministry in the book of Mark. Mark is done recording it. So we enter into chapter 13. Jesus will begin to teach exclusively his disciples in 13. And then as we get into 14 and 15, we see the betrayal of Jesus. We see the crucifixion of Jesus. And then we eventually, of course, we'll see the resurrection of Jesus. Hopefully I'm not stealing my thunder. You, you guys knew that, right? Okay, okay good. I, th I thought, thought probably so. But, isn't it, but, but what a marvelous thing here. And the, the end of the public teaching is this. It all belongs to him. It's his. Be all in for him. Love the Lord your God. Love people around you. Don't use religious pretense. Follow him and him alone. That, I think, is a cool stuff.